invite you to turn to Philippians chapter 1, verse 21. We'll be reading from there in just a few minutes. Philippians chapter 1, verse 21. Uh, two months ago, after a uh, little blood work and a visit to the heart doctor, I realized I needed to make a few changes again. <laughs> And uh, so I've been doing that. And so for the last 60 days, I have walked uh, no less than 10,000 steps a day. And last month, I averaged 12,300 steps a day. I, anyway, I thought I was getting ready for a trip that uh, I'm getting to go on with some friends of mine. Uh, instead of going to Montana this year, we're going to Maine. And uh, we're going to hike Baxter State Park and see moose. And fall colors changing. So I thought I was getting in shape for that. Well, in reality, God had another plan. I was getting ready for the last two days. <laughs> because Friday and Saturday, we walked 21,000 plus steps each day. So I'm glad that happened, all right? Or I, I wouldn't be up here this morning, all right? So God was getting us ready for something. And, and uh, today it's going to be an, an exciting day for a lot of reasons. But I hope for the next 35 minutes we can focus our attention away from diets and exercise and, um, and auction and buildings and ask God, what do you have in store for me? What's next step in my life? What can I learn from the moment I'm in right now? What can I learn from the moment I just finished? And how will that prepare me for another moment of adversity, challenge, chaos, difficulty that's, uh, that's in my future? We've been engaged in a series since the beginning of the summer called Joy and Laughter. You never can have too much. You only can have too little. We spent several weeks looking at what does the Bible have to say about laughter? Can Christians smile and laugh? Is it okay to laugh in church? We, we, we looked at laughter and we got a... We got a kick out of laughter. We laughed our way through it. But laughter that only comes from external influence is very temporary. If somebody told a joke, how long do we laugh? Doesn't last very long. If, if, if we were the joke, <laughs> how long does that last? All right? Uh, it doesn't last very long. But if that ability to laugh, even in life's worst moments... Is going to be reality for us. It must come from an inner source of joy. And you and I do not have that inner source of joy just naturally with us. Joy is not a personality trait. Joy is a gift. It is a gift that God says comes from Him. And so you and I have to understand some things about this relationship that we have with Jesus Christ. So the ability to have joy and to express laughter at any moment, not that we laugh at every moment, but in every moment, we are ready to laugh because there's this sense of joy that wells up in us, that it overflows. It's much like what David said in Psalm 23, my cup runneth over. Now, his cup was running over with all kinds of things, but part of that that spilled out of his overflowing cup was a sense of joy. And when did he say that cup was overflowing? When I walk through the valley of the shadows of death and trouble. And so, Paul writes for us in the book of Philippians about the subject of joy. And what adds extra punch to to the words that he wrote is knowing what he was facing in his own life. He didn't write this from the penthouse suite. He wrote this from the prison cell. He did not write this in a moment of affluence. He wrote this in a season of imprisonment. He didn't write this when things were going the way he wanted them to. He was writing this when it seemed like that everything was working against him. So as he talks about this joy being an inward thing, it is coming not only from God's truth, but also from his personal experience of letting God's truth be functional in him. And so in this first chapter of Philippians, we have been looking at over the last few weeks how adversity, seasons of adversity in our life, promotes the progress of evangelism. In other words, during bad times, I can share good news. We've looked at how adversity produces opportunity for personal sharing. When you and I are in the midst of an adverse situation and people can see a sense of joy and hope functional in us, they scratch their heads and sometimes they're courageous enough to say, 
Marvin, how are you smiling through this? Floyd, how, how, how can you have hope when everything's working against you? Floyd, you could say it's because you're married to Judy, but I know it's a deeper reason than that. <laughs> Adversity also produces courage in our faith family. When we see folks going through tough times and their faith is obvious to us, and while they are going through adversity, they are sharing the love of Christ with others, and, 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 and we just got the promotion and the pay raise and, and the kids who are behaving well, then we're motivated to say, hey, why am I not sharing my faith just like they are? Because life's good for me. Adversity also proves the character of our relationships. Within the family of God, folks, we ought, we ought not to be fair-weather family members. We ought not to be the church family that Joe shows up for the festivities and the parties. We need to be the family that's there at the hospital. We need to be the family that brings food, all right, to somebody's house when, so it just takes a little pressure off. One of our small groups, um, I believe it's Logan and Friends, I think. If I'm wrong, correct me later. Well, actually, you could correct me now if you want. But I think it's Logan's and Friends. They've taken Mike Rasmussen. He's a, he's a, a, a cancer treatment patient right now. 30. He has really no family. Rents a room and a home. Um, uh, that's not Roger Logan's group. That's another group. But, but they took meals to him. Well, he's been going through treatment. We have another family from our church, new to our church. They moved here from the Midwest so that their daughter could be closer to a children's hospital. And uh, she had to go to Stanford. They were there for two, two and a half, maybe close to three weeks, just got home this week. This little girl's in need of a, an eventual heart transplant. And when they got home, word got out to Logan and Friends small group that they were arriving home. They've sort of adopted this family just in the last couple of weeks. And they had food waiting for them when they got to their house. And, and they sent out on a Facebook post to their friends back in the Midwest. These are people we've never met before. And they showed it up our doorstep. They're there to care. You see, we're, we're, th that's what God's family is to be designed for. We are to be there for each other. Sometimes when adversity shows up in your world and in my world, folks scatter. That's not the way God's family is supposed to function. We looked at adversity provokes maturity in our lives. We grow through the hard moments, all right? We, we don't go from infancy to maturity in one day. It requires taking baby steps, and then it requires taking more steps. And, and, and you, you know, couch potatoes are not really very physically in good shape. As my uncle said, Tim, round is a shape. But, but it's, it's when we get up and we exercise and we move that the body gets healthier. It is as our body, our soul goes through the challenges of adversity that it becomes strengthened when we trust Christ in those moments. Adversity purifies our motives. Am I doing this to show off for other people or am I doing this because my life has been made available to Christ for him to show off in me, for me, and through me? Today we're going to look at the last thing out of this chapter, and that is adversity prepares us with a new perspective about life and death. You see, here's the reality for every one of us. We're living life, and one day we'll experience death. Can't disconnect the two. Dying is a part of living. And Paul gives us a particular perspective here that adversity prepares us with a new perspective about how to live until we die. I'm going to share something very profound with you. You've probably never thought of this ever before. Life is often confusing and complicated. <laughs> Isn't that profound? It's probably the biggest understatement I have ever said from this podium. In his famous Peanuts cartoon, Charles Schultz marvelously captured this reality of this understatement. In one of his cartoons, Lucy was front and center, delivering one of her characteristic lectures. And she said, Charlie Brown, life is a lot like a deck chair. Some place it so they can see where they're going. And others place it so they can see where they've been. And some place it so they can see where they are right at the moment. 
on the cruise ship of life, Charlie Brown, which way is your deck chair facing? <sighs> Charlie Brown sighs and he says, I can't even get mine unfolded. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds a little about life, doesn't it? Charlie Brown ought to go down as maybe one of the wisest men next to Solomon that we've ever known. Life can be complicated and it can be confusing. We can get stuck focusing on our past or the future or even in the present moment. And in that stuck position, we lose our perspective. The Apostle Paul did not have that problem, at least when he wrote this passage. Paul may have struggled having the right perspective and the right priorities and the right principles before he became a believer in Jesus Christ. But after he knew Jesus, he found someone to live and to die for. In the verse, Philippians 1.21, and the verses that preceded it, we've been observing his basic life principle. This principle is what gave Paul purpose and meaning to his life. This principle guided his every choice, and in the end, it gave him comfort in death. Follow along with me if you have your Bible open to verse 21, Philippians chapter 1. For to me, to live is Christ, to die is gain. Short, simple, sweet. In fact, there's not a one of you in here, including the birthday girl, who is too old to memorize this verse if you haven't memorized it already. It's one sentence, all right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Twelve words, cheaper by the dozen, all right? Twelve words, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. You see, when a believer, a Christian, faces adversity, especially if it is intense and a prolonged period of time, but Paul was, this was not just a few months, this was a couple of years. His perspective on life and death is brought into very sharp focus. And for Paul, the issue was not, listen to this, for Paul, the issue was not his desire to die in order to escape suffering. Paul loved life and he accepted his imprisonment as a, a means that God would use to do a perfect plan in him. He also knew that God had plans for his future. And as he contemplated his present joy in his existing predicament and he compared it to the promised joy of heaven, he found himself caught between two great loves of his life. H-C-G Mole. And if you want to know what the H-C-G stands for, look it up. He had a very ugly name. All right, so he went by all of his initials. H-C-G Mole. He was an Englishman. He was uh, a theologian, an Anglican theologian. He was a writer. He was a poet. He was a bishop. He died in 1920. He also was one of the speakers at the very first Keswick Convention. All right, remember I told you part of preaching is to learn something, right? So how many of you know what a Keswick Convention is? Raise your hand. I expect three hands to go up. Mike Rude, I expected your hand to go up. <laughs> Probably can't hear me. I got to talk louder. For the Keswick Convention... Um, the, there were, God was doing a movement, all right, back in the, the, the late 1800s, all right? And it was being taken place all around the world. It was taking place in the church in Germany. It was taking place in England, of, of all places, Mark, in England, and, 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 and also in, in America. You see, for a century or two, the church international to become much like the Pharisees of Judaism at the time of Christ. You must do this for God to love you. You must do this, this, and this in order to be acceptable to God. You must wear out for Jesus. And God was doing a movement by His Spirit in the lives of people and said, no, the Christian life is not about what you do to become a Christian. It is about what you allow Christ to do in you, for you, and through you. 
We live the Christian life not by human effort, but by the indwelling presence of the Son. It's not what I can do, but what I let him do. And so the Keswick Convention became known as a Deeper Life Conference. And only selected folks, Major Ian Thomas, who's preached in this podium before, he's now in heaven, was one of the speakers in the later years at the Keswick Convention, understanding the deeper life of knowing that Jesus lives in us. So H.C.G. Molay, let's get back to his quote, describes these two loves in the midst of adversity when he said, life and death to us. Life and death looks to us like two evils of which we know not which is the less. As for the Apostle Paul, they look to him like two immense blessings of which he knows not which is better. That's the perspective. Paul saw life and death as equally desirable. If he continued to live, he would come to know and love and serve the Lord more fully. If he died, he would completely and finally, perfectly know Christ. He was caught between these two desires, personally and a sense of privilege to help the Philippians. Ralph Waldo Emerson was approached by a troubled man who said with great anxiety, I'm told the world is coming to an end. Emerson answered, never mind, we can get along without it. The hope of heaven gives us confidence beyond this present age. Let's notice a little more. Not a, Paul has a conviction here. For me to live is Christ. To die is gain. This is one of the shortest and simplest texts. Paul's basic life focus and philosophy was when you live for Christ, death is victory. Paul said to live is Christ. Let's see what that implies for us. What we need to realize is that every single one of us is living for something or someone. Every one of us. Every person who has lived in the past, who is living now, or will live in the future can fill in the blank of this sentence with something. For me to live is... Yep, Paul said Christ. You and I can quote the scripture, but what's the right answer for me? Right now we're at the thrust of college and professional football season. If you are a football fan, we had a few at 8 o'clock service. That means there's a game coming on during the 915 service, and they didn't want to miss it. If you are into football, then you might say, for me to live is football. Ask a family two weeks ago, did a memorial service for their husband and their dad. I said, what was your dad's favorite hobby? Football. What was your dad's favorite thing to watch on TV? Football. What was your dad's favorite sport? Football. He lived for football. That may be fun for life. Doesn't sound like much fun for death, does it? If you're a professional musician, you might say, for me to live is music. If you're Bill Gates, you might say, for me to live is Microsoft. If you're Mark Zuckerberg, you might say, for me to live is Facebook. A teenager might say, for me to live is my boyfriend, my girlfriend, or my smartphone. A parent or a grandparent might say, for me to live is my kids or my grandkids. See, see the list of possibilities is endless. We can live for self or fun or sex or money or career, you name it, but we must not miss the point. No one leaves this sentence blank. Everyone finishes the sentence with someone or something in the blank. What fills in your blank? I believe Shelley will remember this conversation. I probably should have asked her before church and before I preached it. But before we were married, I told Shelly that I would never love her most. I said, I will always love Christ most so I can love you best. And I said, if you don't love me in that same way, there'll probably be trouble. It's what it takes. I, I, I have two grandsons. I, 
I love them dearly. I'd, I'd lay down my life for them. But you know what? I love Christ more. I want Shelly to know Christ will always be preeminent. As my grandkids grow up, I want them to know that Grandpa, I don't know why I'm Grumppa, but I'm Grandpa. <laughs> I want them to know I love Christ most so I can love them best. I'll never forget, and, and, and this is a dangerous illustration to tell, and it's not in my notes, and I probably should jump right past it. But I've never forgotten what my mother told a young mother who after she had had this baby, she couldn't, she didn't have time if you called her to pray. She didn't have time if you called her about Bible study. She did, she, her, her concept was, you know what? No, no I got to do this for my, my, my baby. No time for prayer. No time for Bible study. No time for fellowship in the church. And my mother, very lovingly and kindly, because my mother loved this young mother, and she said, you know, God has a way sometimes of removing those things that are stumbling blocks to our relationship with him. And I would never want my misplaced love to be the reason that something was removed from my world. Paul understood the power of the simplicity of a singular focus in our life. There must be nothing or no one more important. And when we get that right, then we elevate everything else in our life much higher than we could on our own. What would it look like for a person to say, to live as Christ? It means that a person's whole life is wrapped up in living for him. Living for Christ is their purpose and their focus. Christ is the inspiration and the model and the strength for their life. Christ is also the reward of their life. No greater reward than knowing him more fully in eternity. And so the Christ, as Christians, our goal should be to live in Christ, to live for Christ, to live by Christ, to live through Christ. But if we don't desire to finish the sentence with Christ and Christ alone, as the old hymn says, then the second statement that Paul makes in that sentence ends up drastically different. Paul said, to live is Christ, to die is gain. But if we fill in the blank with anything else other than Christ, consider how that changes the outcome. If for us to live is money, then to die is loss. I've told it before. It's an old story. But remember the lady whose husband had become a millionaire after they got married? And he'd worked very hard. And he became a millionaire. And, and in front of his three best friends, he told his wife, I want you to promise that when I die, you'll bury my million dollars with me in the casket. I'm going it with me. She agreed. A few years passed. He passed away. Those three guys show up at the funeral. They go up to the casket. They pay their regards to their friend. They feel around the casket. No money. They go straight to the wife and say, you made a promise to my friend. We're here to see that you keep it. She said, I put the million dollars in the casket. And she said, well, we didn't feel it. Where is it? She said, it's in his pocket. I wrote a check. <laughs> Can't take it with you, folks. Cash or check. If for us to live is our career, then to die is loss. If for us to live for pleasure, weekends, fishing, boating, fancy cars, or anything else, if that's our goal, then to die, if it gets in the way, to die is trouble. Do you see how that if we live for anything other than him, then die is loss? Everything else we might live for other than Christ is tied to this world, and to die is to leave it in this world. How is death a gain for the Christian? Well, the famous preacher Alexander McLaren answered the question this way. He said, in death, we lose everything we don't need. We lose the world. We lose our fleshly nature. We leave the devil behind. We lose our trials, our troubles, our tears, our fears, our weaknesses, and this old body. In death, we keep everything that matters. We keep our personality, our identity, and our knowledge of all that is good. 
And in death, we gain what we never had before. We gain heaven. We get an angelic choir singing for us every day. We get the people of God to fellowship with. And most importantly, we get to see God face to face. Ultimately, when we understand that to live is Christ and die is gain, then we have no fear of death. Many years ago, I... Um, a Southern Baptist evangelist, not really one of my favorite folks, but he was an interesting character, Dr. John Rice. He was very legalistic, but he was a powerful preacher. He preached in a meeting in Waxahachie, Texas. It's a little town south of Dallas. Dr. Rice preached hard against sin. I mean, he was, he was a f hellfire and damnation preacher. And in that particular town, at that particular time, he was preaching hard against bootleggers. Now you all know what bootleggers are? Okay, all right. He was preaching hard against bootleggers, and it made him mad. And so they went to him, and they were going to silence this pesky evangelist. And they said to Dr. Rice, stop preaching against us, or we'll kill you. Dr. Rice's response was this, you can't threaten me with heaven. He said, go ahead and kill me. You're doing me a favor. It's better than where I am. Paul's confidence. Paul had convictions to live as Christ, but he also had a confidence to die as gain. In verse 23, he says, I desire to depart to be with Christ. This word depart is used in many illustrative ways during Paul's time. It was used to describe soldiers when they would take down their tent to move on to the next place. It was used with sailors to describe when they would loosen a ship, all right, and they would pull away from the dock. It was used for prisoners as a description of when they were set free from prison. It was a term that farmers used when they would unyoke the oxen after a day of work. Wonderful, beautiful word pictures of a Christian view of death. Moving our tent from here to heaven. Setting sail for another world. Being freed from the bondage of, of physical pain and struggles. Laying aside the burdens of earthly work. I like the story from the former president, John Quincy Adams. When he was 80 years old, a friend asked him, Well, how is John Quincy Adams today? And Adams replied, John Quincy Adams is quite well, thank you. But the house where John lives is becoming a little dilapidated. It's tottering some these days. The time and seasons have nearly destroyed this old house, and it's just about uninhabitable. I shall move soon. But John Quincy Adams, he's quite well, thank you. I love that answer. John Quincy Adams obviously understood what Paul wrote in Philippians, but also what he wrote in 2 Corinthians 5, 1 through 10. Now we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Meanwhile, we groan, longing to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling, because when we are clothed, we will not be found naked. While we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened because we do not wish to be unclothed. I didn't get to design the house Shelly and I moved into. And maybe you live in a house like this and I'll scratch my head at you just like I scratch my head over the people who designed the master bathroom. I have never understood in my life why somebody puts a full-size mirror right outside the shower. <laughs> Can anybody explain it to me? Why in the world, when the first thing I step out of a shower, do I want to look at myself in a mirror? I, I groan. I do exactly what Paul said. I groan. Because I don't want to be seen unclothed. So, 
know, the scripture goes on to say, that what is mortal will be swallowed up by life. Now it is God who has made us this very purpose and has given us the Spirit as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. Therefore, we are always confident, and we know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. We live by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say. I would prefer to be away from this body and home with the Lord, so we make it our goal to please Him, whether we are at home in this body or away from it, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive what is due them for the things done in the body, whether good or bad. Let me wrap this up. Let me tell you about James Rich. James was proud of the new job he had done restoring his 1972 Piper Seneca. It's a small aircraft. He had overhauled twin engines and he'd given it a smart new paint job. Early in the morning on February the 17th, 1994, James crawled between the controls of a small airplane and he went out an airport near Louisville, Kentucky, to take it on an inaugural flight. Rich's plan was to make a 30-minute flight to Crossville, Tennessee, to show off his plane to a friend who was the airport manager there. He took off down the runway, climbed to 3,500 feet, and he put the plane on autopilot. Rich had been up most of the night before, finishing the last touches on his plane's restoration, and before he knew it, he dozed off to sleep. His little nap went for three hours. And when he woke up, he noticed nothing but water. Rich's initial thought is, I must be over a big lake. But then he noticed the water extended to the horizons in all direction. James Rich found himself in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico. He was 188 miles west of Clearwater, Florida, and 190 miles south of Panama City, Florida. Rich didn't panic until he looked at the gas gauge. It was on E. He had just enough time to radio an SOS, giving them his exact location before the plane went down. His plane sank out of sight in 45 seconds. But within 15 minutes, a rescue helicopter showed up and pulled him out of the water. James Rich's heroin experience reminds all of us we need to stay alert about the direction of our lives. It's all too easy to put our life on autopilot unaware how far off course we have gone. Life can pass us so quickly and the fact that we are getting somewhere fast will be of small consolation if our landing site is off. There may be no rescue for us when our life comes to a crashing conclusion. There's only one way to live so that we can face living and dying with peace, courage, and joy. And that one way to live is Christ. The wisest man who ever lived, Solomon, said it like this in Ecclesiastes 12. Fear God. Keep his commandments. This is the whole duty of man. Jesus said it this way in Luke 9, for whoever wants to save his life should lose it. But whoever loses his life for me will save it. And my prayer this morning is that all of us can have Paul's conviction that to live is Christ. And I pray that all of us can have Paul's confidence that God is in charge and to die is gain. For that kind of conviction and confidence leads to courage, peace, and joy for the journey from here to there. If you don't know Christ, you don't get to know him by a series of works of good deeds. You get to know him by personally admitting that you need him and you invite him into your life. No magic formula, no special words, just an honest confession that says, God, I need you and I want you. Come live in my life. If you're here today and you've been a Christian for weeks, months, or years, maybe even decades, but you've been on autopilot, this is a great time for you to say, Lord Jesus, I don't want to be on autopilot. I want to turn over the controls of my life to you. I'm ready for you to fly in the master seat of this craft. I want you to lead every step, every word, every direction I go. Let's pray. Father, 
Thank you for our time and your word today. Thank you for what you moved in the mind and heart and soul of Paul to write. 2,000 plus years ago, it still stings as we apply it to our own life today. But Father, as my dad used to say when he would put methylate on a cut, it'll feel better when it stops hurting. God, the truth is the same. When we get over the pain of admitting that we are sinners, when we get over the pain of admitting that we've been trying to run our life, when we get over the pain of trying to be the master of our own destiny, we get over the pain of having to confess our failures, you replace the pain with things like joy, courage, and hope. Thank you for hearing the prayers of those in this room right now who are going through the pain only to bring them to the promise. Thank you for hearing our prayers. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a great afternoon.